Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 223. Learning to make films is very easy. Learning what to make films about is very hard. George Lucas. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, Indie Film Hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's episode is brought to you by Blackbox. Blackbox is a new platform and community that is all about financial freedom for filmmakers like you. If you join Blackbox, you will be transformed from being a worker to being a maker of your own content. And you'll be making steady passive income from the global market. Blackbox currently allows you to upload your stock footage once, get it to many global agencies, and then allows you to share that passive income stream with your collaborators. Whether you want to submit old footage that's been sitting around in your hard drives or create brand new content, Blackbox is for you. It's really quite revolutionary. With Blackbox, filmmakers can concentrate on making great content while Blackbox takes care of all the business BS. Just visit www.blackbox.global to find out more. Today's show is also sponsored by Studio Unknown. Studio Known is a crack team of audio post professionals known for quality sound on any indie budget. Whether you need a lush surround sound mix or a quick festival submission pass, Studio Known can help you with all of your post sound needs, from sound design and mix to Foley ADR and even a custom score. Contact Studio Known and mention the Indie Film Hustle podcast, and you'll get 50% off one day of ADR or 10% off your complete post sound package. Just go to studiounknown.com. Welcome, guys. So today's episode, we have Elliot Grove on the show. And Elliot is the founder of the Rain Dance Film Festival in England. And it's actually now a worldwide film festival. He's got uh, festivals from all over the world uh, as well. Rain Dance LA, Rain Dance uh, all over the place. So uh, I wanted to bring Elliot on because not only is he the founder of of uh, Rain Dance, but he's also a best-selling author, and he has just been a champion of independent filmmaking, independent filmmakers, education for filmmakers through his Rain Dance banner, and he has just a ton of knowledge bombs to give the tribe today. So I wanted to bring him on the show and talk to him. And just on a personal note, I've been a fan of his for a while. I've known about his stuff uh, when I was coming up as a filmmaker in my early days. He's been doing this for many, many years. So without any further ado, here is my conversation with Elliot Grove. I'd like to welcome to the show, Elliot Grove. How are you doing, my friend? Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, to come on the show. My pleasure, Alex. And great to be on Indie Film Hustle for yeah. the first time ever. That's <laughs> a, that's a good, I'm a virgin. <laughs> yes, you are. Well, I've been, I've been a fan of yours for a while and been looking... Um, uh, been looking at what you guys do on uh, on your website, and, and we're going to get into more about the social media and the blogging and all that kind of stuff, uh, what you do with your website. But first, before we even get into it, how did you get into this business? Uh, well, I grew up on a farm outside Toronto. My parents told me I should never go to the movie theater. They're Amish extraction. Mm-hmm. I was always told that the devil lived in the movie theater, and <laughs> they cautioned me, and I said, you wouldn't want to be caught in the movie theater when Jesus came back now, would you? So I pretty much ignored it. And then I went, I ended up going to art school in Toronto and um, ended up working as a scenic artist on loads and loads of stuff. First of all, Britain in the mid seventies and then back in Toronto in the mid eighties. And I worked on dozens and hundreds of TV shows and really, really bad movies in Toronto. The kinds of movies with the word slime or gore, (laughs) or Massacre in the title. Uh, and in London, I was a stagehand on some of the iconic TV shows like Monty Python the last year and Doctor mm-hmm. Who and so on. And then I did all kinds of other stuff. Um, my CV has about 60 different jobs that I applied for with a CV and got work, uh, including I was the project manager on the Kennedy Space Arm that was made in Montreal for the space shuttle. And then in London, in the winter of discontent when everyone was broke, I was actually stooped to being a debt collector for a few weeks until mm-hmm. I got so sick of it. And then I decided to go back into film, and I really knew nothing at all, Alex. I mean, my knowledge of filmmaking was based on my on-set experience, which is 
you know, when you're a painter, a scenic painter, you, you leave by the time you start filming. Mm -hmm. And then um, I just started it one day and, and we started doing training courses with one in Los Angeles iconic film teacher, Dove Simmons, way, way, way back. Oh, yeah, Dove, uh, of course. And then I started the film festival and I had no idea what I was doing. And I've been very, very fortunate. I've always um, been surrounded by people who knew more than I did and were happy to share with my naive, naive self what to do. To the point now, 25 years later with the Rain Dance Film Festival, people look to us as, as being sort of, um, you know, we know what we're doing, supposedly. I, I, still, <laughs> we, I still marvel at that. <laughs> we, we've been around long enough to so a certain point where like, well, they've been here for so long, they must be doing something right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, yeah, how... Um, no, so, how did Rain Dance come to be? Well, I just started it one day. Um, <laughs> I just just said, let's do it. I went and booked the local cinema right in the center of town here in London, England, and opened up. For, I, I got that year's Cannes product guide, and at that point, I'd never been to Cannes, and I circled about 100 films that I sort of admired. And because they had the fax number the, in the days before email, mm -hmm. I wrote a one-page press release at that time, I was sharing office with a graphic designer, and the phone bill was a pound per page for an international fax. Oof. And I had exactly 100 pounds, about $150, to my name. And I spent it that day until the money ran out. And to my amazement, half of them came. And so that's how we started the festival. And it was completely crazy thought. I don't think I could do that now. <laughs> but somehow we've survived. The third year was an iconic year. We had absolutely no money. And one of our venues bailed because we couldn't afford to pay the deposit. And in those days, we're charging two pounds, about three bucks for a ticket. And there were practically no advance sales. And I ended up screening on a bed sheet in the basement of an arts theater club right in the center of town. <laughs> much, much to people I meet who were there, the few people who were there still... Uh, tease me about that. But hey, we survived. And this last year, this, this year, 2017, our 25th year, we were in Leicester Square in one of the prime cinema locations, I suppose, in the world, in a beautiful, gorgeous uh, cinema um, screening, five screenings uh, simultaneously, 20, 20 shows a day. So that was that was cool. Now, did, I, I thought I read somewhere, but please, and forgive me if I made a mistake or not, did you have something to do with Chris Nolan at the very beginning of his career with the, the following? Well, he my, my office at the time was in Soho, and he needed a place as a base, and so he used my office as a base because he could store his equipment there. He was shooting on weekends. He shot weekends for nine months, and many weekends he used our office. I'd give him the key on a Friday, and he collected from me. Uh, I collected back from him on a Monday. So um, yeah, I mean, no, how did that how did that relationship work out? Because obviously he wasn't a Chris Nolan at the time. So you were just helping out another film, just a filmmaker, just helping yeah, him out. Yeah. yeah, sort of what we do at Rain Dance, and um, I know many filmmakers equally talented as, as Chris is, um, but have yet to achieve either the commercial or critical success that Chris Nolan has. And well deserved in his case, of course. Um, but my first intern back then was a guy called Edgar Wright, who just hit the big time with Baby Driver and sure. a host, a host of people. I mean, many of the British filmmakers that you read about now um, have touched Rain Dance in some way or other. Uh, Chris was our filmmaker in residence in was it 1999 or 2000? Mm -hmm. That was the year Memento came out, uh, and the Blair, and the Blair Witch Project. So it was a a bit of a struggle to decide which film we would have as opening night. So it was Blair Witch Run out. I don't think he'd forgotten me, uh, forgiven me at that yet, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, to, to your defense, Blair Witch was a monster film that year and kind of changed the game in many ways. Um, now, do you have any tips? You know, you must, well, first of all, you must see thousands of movies a year. Uh, is there any tips for filmmakers to get their film noticed? By a film festival, you know, when they're submitting or any in any any way. Well, Raindance is unique, I think, from most film festivals in that we watch every single film at least once, if not two or three times. So, mm -hmm. if you were a programmer, Alex, and saw a film and really liked it, it would go on a short list. If you saw a film and really didn't like it, someone else would watch it, and if they didn't like it, then 
would, would not go on the short list, but if someone else did, mm -hmm. then it would be one yes, one no, and we'll go to a third person, and then it would go on the short list, and then it comes down to scheduling. Um, and we watch every single film. We had a total of nearly 10,500 shorts, features, VR projects, and music videos submitted last year. Uh, here we are coming up to Christmas 2017. We've already had 1,500 submitted for autumn 2018. And we pride ourselves on looking at work. Um, and often some of the films that come in, people might say no, like The Year of Blair Witch. I bet a lot of people, I mean, I saw that on VHS before all the hype. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was, you know, worth showing. It didn't, it didn't have the hype then. It was just a sort of another American horror film. But, and, and that every once in a while we make a mistake. We show a film that really is, we shouldn't have. And oftentimes we say no to a film that we just, we didn't get. Mm -hmm. But to answer your question, a film from a rain dance point of view needs to be extreme in three different ways. First of all, it needs to be extreme storytelling. And I underscore the word story because many films fail because they don't tell a story. And I don't care if it's a documentary or short or whatever. So story first. But we're looking for extreme topics. That's what distinguishes rain dance. Um, films with social impact, who are exploring boundaries of what is uh, currently acceptable or not, or teaching us something that we're overlooking. And I can't wait to see all the American films this year re referring to the horrendous political atmosphere mm -hmm. coming out of America right now. Mm -hmm. The second form of extreme is extreme filmmaking. So we've had films made under extremely dire circumstances in war-torn areas or extreme filmmaking using pushing the boundaries of new techniques and so on. Mm -hmm. And the third extreme, of course, because it is the entertainment industry and it's film, it needs to be extremely entertaining. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. <laughs> well, it's hard to tick all those boxes, believe it or not. And, no, it is yeah. e extremely hard. I've seen many movies. It's not, it's not yeah. easy to click all those boxes. Um, yeah. Now, you also have, you've, you've li like a, a friendly virus. Rain dance has grown throughout the world <laughs> and has infected many other cities. How many rain dances do you have currently? Uh, there's about 10, I believe. Um, we're talking to people in Japan, and we hope to launch... Um, in Tokyo in April 2018, so that that's going to be exciting. The one thing I've I always you know was so uh, such a fan of with Rain Dance is the social media and the way you use your blog and content creation to spread the word on Rain Dance. And I don't think there are many festivals uh, that do what you guys do in the way you've done. And you were doing it before it was in. Uh, in vogue, if you will, you were you were hustling <laughs> back in the day um, and and mm -hmm. talking about things that now we take for granted. But if you mm -hmm. even just go on YouTube and type your name in Rain Dance, you you were talking about stuff in 2008, 2009, 11 that mm -hmm. we're now taking for granted. But back then, you already were seeing like this is where it's going to be. There's this thing called VOD. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know, uh, really? back, you're very flattering, Alex. Yeah, um, but it's true. We, we, it's true. It's true. But the, the the thing is with the with the social media and how you use social media and how to use your blog. Can you discuss the importance of of those things of content creation, using of the blog and social media to create and build your own audience and see and how we can translate that to, to filmmakers? Well, you're the expert on that, of course, Alex. With what you've done, the amazing work that you've done. Thank you. Um, well, you know, people believe what they read, mm -hmm. and so you have to be very careful that you put out stuff that's accurate. And there's been times, I know a whole lot over the years, where we've said something that was incorrect or inaccurate. But having said that, it is amazingly useful for any filmmaker or screenwriter to have a blog. Because on a blog, or maybe I should back up, what is social media? Social media is conversation. So, for example, when before we started recording, how are you? I like Rain Dance. I like Indie Film Hustle. We talked back and forth. Mm -hmm. In the end, it doesn't really mean anything. That's a phatic conversation, and that's really what your social media and your blog posts have to be phatic, but interesting and entertaining. So you can't say, I'm going down to the store to get another pack of bags or a bottle of beer. You have to say something always that's interesting. Uh, the second 
part of social media is every once in a while you can do emphatic conversation. Mm -hmm. In other words, a call to action or so-called CTA. Come see my movie, donate to my Indiegogo crowdfunding, or, or, or come to one of the events at Raindance Film Festival. So a bit like when we finish the conversation, I'll go in the next room and say to my long-suffering partner, hi, honey, I'm home. Mm -hmm. She might say, you're late. I want a divorce. <laughs> That's not which a good is, conversation. <laughs> which is emphatic, you see. Sure. And the trick, I think, is in our social media is trying to make people aware of what we're doing. And this is my advice to filmmakers, too. Um, make people aware of what you're doing and especially building your your following. I had a woman come into the Rain Dance office here in London uh, a few weeks ago. She said, can you help me with my crowdfunding campaign? I said, sure. How many Twitter followers do you have? And she said, seven. <laughs> so, Did you say uh, including your mom? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't. I said, call me back when you've got a thousand. Uh -huh. And speaking of social media, uh, crowdfunding too, having done a dozen or more here, social media the mistake that I see a lot of filmmakers making is they go to social media and crowdfunding to get the money. And that almost certainly fails. Mm -hmm. You use your social media and you use your crowdfunding campaign to tell people what it is you're doing and why you're doing it. And if they like it, then you get the money. So that's sort of back to front. Um, our blog, too, has many lists, you've probably noticed the 10 of this and the 7 of that and the 14 of this. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you noticed that. And that's a very good technique, too, because when people come to it, they know how much time they have to commit. Is it mm -hmm. 5 points or 10 points or 15 points? And we use that well, the, hit, the reason we started doing that was uh, in 2009, I had the most a brilliant intern starting uh, a woman, Frederica, and she said to me, Monday morning, what do you want me to do? And I gave her a long list, hoping it would last her till Wednesday, but blow me down by lunchtime. She said, what do you want me to do next? She was so amazing. Mm -hmm. and so I gave her another list. At 3 o'clock, she was finished. And the third time she was finished, I'm scratching my head thinking, oh, my God, I'm not going to get anything done. I have to keep instructing this new intern. Mm -hmm. And as I stopped the third time, I realized I was going through my trash folder, which I do every now and again, and I paused on a sex spam. And I, it was titled, 10 Ways to Make Her Come Every Day. <laughs> okay. I was wondering why I stopped that, and I realized it's very emotive. Ten ways to every day. So I clicked on it and opened it up just to see what it was all about, and sure enough, it was a very well-structured article, albeit sex spam. And so what I did is I did a find, I copied it into Word, did a find and replace, uh, replace cock for filmmaker. I sent it to this wonderful person. I said, could you please rewrite this? And she wrote it, rewrote it basically word for word, except with film instead of sex words, mm -hmm. as 10, way, uh, 10 things a filmmaker needs every day. And for about two years, it was one of the top pages on her website. So then I discovered the list-based thing. And then another thing happened maybe three, four years ago. There was a, a very famous Dutch filmmaker in London. I've known him for a while by the name of Arthur de Jong. He made a British classic comedy some 20 years ago called Drop Dead Fred with Rick Mayo, which is quite popular here. Mm -hmm. And he just had a commercial disaster in Holland, the worst film, the worst reception ever in his life. He directed 20 odd films and produced with Mick Jagger and so on. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, you need to reinvent yourself as a cult filmmaker. He said, oh, I can't do that. I don't want to dye my hair purple. I'm an <laughs> agent in LA. So, so he went back to Amsterdam that afternoon, and I wrote a, a, a blog article called 10 Cult Film Directors uh, You Should Watch, right. Tarantino, David Lynch, blah, blah. and then I put his name in, and I sent it to him. He got it the next morning. He said, oh, my God. I, I said, you can't, we can't have this out here. People are going to read it. I said, well, that's the whole point. I said, I wrote it. You didn't write it. So, for example, I could do 10 uh, film blogs you should listen to. I could put you down, for example, Alex. Mm -hmm. I can say that. You can't say, watch me, because it's crazy. Right. Anyway, three days later, he's in Amsterdam getting a, a big award. 
and they, he was introduced as the film director known as a cult film director <laughs> in the United Kingdom, showing the power of, of your blog. You know, of, of, you know, once you start saying it and say it in the right way. And since then, he's produced, let me think, three cult movies, micro-budget movies, getting away from the 5 and 10 and $20 million movies that he had been doing, mm-hmm. having more fun. He tells me oh, on much any more. one of those films than he did in any of the big budget films. I've, I'll, t- I'll I'll say from from first hand experience making a a micro budget film. It is so much more fun than working on big budget projects. It's just so sure. much more fun. Sure, sure, sure. So yeah, that and that was the thing I saw that you you continue to use that. I don't think there are any other, or if there are, there they don't they haven't made the the noise that you've been able to make. Um, that at least that caught my eye. Um, that you know, festivals. I'm sure other festivals have studied what you've done because what you've been able to do over the course of, you know, almost a quarter of a century now, uh, is to build the brand of Rain Dance. To it is one of the big brands around the the world, around the globe, and even all the way over here. You know, when I was living in Florida, I knew about Rain Dance. You know, uh, wow. you know and I wow. heard about that because it was if you would just go online anywhere, you would hear about. Rain dance, you know, like oh, rain dance. It's it's the Sundance of of London, you know, <laughs> the, the Sundance <laughs> of of England, and that's the way I always considered it. So it's yeah. the amazing the power of of good branding, good marketing, uh, is is pretty remarkable what you've been able to do. Well, that's very flattering coming from you, but branding it's all about branding. And as a filmmaker, you've got two different types of brands you need to manage. One is the brand of your film. Is it a horror? Is it a rom-com or whatever, or a social impact? And the other, of course, is your personal branding. What kind of person are you? And branding has got nothing to do with the logo or a website. All branding means is what people think about you. Mm-hmm. Are you punctual? Are you honest? Are you fun to be with? Are you smart? You know, you can have the, the best logo in the world, and I'm mm-hmm. thinking of an American film production and distribution company that starts with the letter W that had good branding that has been totally destroyed by the the co-founder, Harvey Weinstein, Mm -hmm. has completely ruined the brand. Right. Um, Because people think bad things about him, and likewise, it's probably going to fold, I think. Oh, no, it it can't make it under... it, It would have to change the name, and even if it changes the name, the industry would still know it's them. So mm. it's going to be real difficult for them to ever come back from that. But it's true. Mm. It's all about branding. And before, Weinstein's name was the ultimate brand in independent mm. film mm. because of what he did yeah. in the 90s. You know, and, yeah. and you know, he brought up Robert Rodriguez, Tarantino, Kevin Smith, and, mm. and the list goes on and on. But now that same brand is now the albatross around the company's name, <laughs> around the company. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting... It's, 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 a, it's an interesting case study. And by the way, Donald Trump is brilliant at social media, like his politics or not, which I'm assuming you don't. Mm-hmm. Um, the way he, he manages that um, is, is probably going to be a media course study in university a year or two after he gets kicked out of office. Oh, without, without question. I mean, what he, you know, regardless of your politics and regardless of you like him or not, what him and his team were able to do with social media um, and the you know how he targeted the brand that he was going after and the people that he was going after it is it's very uh, you know you have to study it regardless if you like it or not uh, it, it is what it is um, but what he was able to do with social media is a case study without question without without question now can, can you talk a little bit about uh, in your opinion because you've been around the block a couple times um, what do you think the future of independent film distribution is going to be in, in, in the sense of how we're going to get our movies out there, how we're going to be able to make money and so on? Well, there's three different ways you can make money. First of all, th- stop thinking of yourself as the 120-minute, 90-minute feature film maker and see if you can chapter your story. And not all, sto- not all stories suit chaptering. And then use the, the web series model where you earn, supposedly earn money from advertising mm-hmm. um, on a web series. So that's one way. Of course, self-distribution is the very, very big way to do it. Uh, it's a bit like you either go to, is it Ralph's in L.A., the big, depart- big supermarket? Ralph's, yeah. You, 
you either buy your vegetables straight from Ralph's and pay a premium, or you pay the same price to the farmer by driving through the countryside and, and buying direct from the farmer, buying direct from the filmmaker. So that's the second way you make money. And the third way is through branded content where you get a sponsor to do something. Uh, get, sorry, you get a sponsor who agrees what you're doing, mm -hmm. who thinks what you're doing suits their brand values, mm -hmm. and they will then fund your, your, your program, be it short, feature, web series, documentary. A bit like you and McGregor with uh, Charlie Borman. He did two round-the-world motorcycle I lo trips. I love that. I love that series. It was amazing. Yeah, well, each logo on the gas tank was a uh, million dollars or a million pounds or something hugely expensive. Right. But that was branded by Harley Davidson, the clothing company. Not that the, he's a Harley bike guy, but uh -huh. it was Harley Davidson clothing. It was Harley Davidson grilling, but I think he was, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, he was driving BMWs. Oh, was he? Oh, uh, I think okay. he was driving okay. BMWs because I remember that whole conversation with BMW. I, I love that series. For anyone listening, I'll put it in the show notes. There was this great series by Ewan McGregor and his buddy who decided to take a, go around the world on a bike. And I think he started in in it was in in uh, I don't know where he started. Somewhere in Europe. It was either in London or Paris or somewhere like that. And he literally drove all the way to L.A., if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. It's, yeah. it's insane. But, yeah, that was a great – yeah, he branded that. But, he, I mean, he has the star power, and that helped out, and, and it worked. But uh, Well, he, it, he had the personal brand. He had the brand of Ewan McGregor, this actor who does big, big, like, uh, Hollywood movies and does uh, small indie British films. Mm -hmm. So he had the brand name, which, again, points to the, the value of a personal brand. He married it up with a brand of brand. And then he, he, he had the branding of the show. So branding is really what it's all about. And I think filmmakers also have to remember that they are communicators. And what is it you're communicating? So what message do you have, be it mm -hmm. a narrative drama of some genre mm -hmm. or uh, a social impact uh, statement of some sort? And then, of course, who's your audience, who you're aiming at, it? where do they go to look for stuff? and how you're going to access it. And you were very flattering earlier about mm -hmm. the branding of Rain Dance in our blog, but we've got a problem, um, Alex. There's no one single demographic. Our age range goes mm -hmm. from 18 to 80. Mm -hmm. All very diverse, all different religions and nationalities and even languages. Just like our postgraduate film degree, our, some of our students come straight out of uh, the normal BA mm -hmm. program. But um, there's a guy in L.A., David Worth, the cinematographer who shot Clint Eastwood's first two films, graduated uh, last summer at the age of 75 or 76. So when we're trying to find out where our audience is, we can't, say, buy a Facebook ad and target it onto 18 to 24, whatever, whatever. We have to go very broad, which makes our advertising budget astronomical. Yes, <laughs> yes, it's 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 for for a film festival. It must be very unless it's a very specific kind of film festival. But yours isn't. You're not just a horror festival or not a you know a niche festival. You are a much more broad spectrum festival. So, getting to that audience uh, is very difficult. Hence, why your social media, your blog, and what you do is the smart way. Content creation is a smart way of of gathering and getting those uh, those mm. leads, if you will. Mm -hmm. Now, with in, in today's world, I mean, as far as filmmaker brands, which I want to talk a little bit about filmmaker brands, uh, Alfred Hitchcock was arguably probably the master of it. He was probably the first real, um, first filmmaker brand that people really recognized. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I'm not a film scholar or historian, but if you told me that your film was like a Hitchcock film, I would have a very clear idea of what to expect. Right, exactly, exactly. Because Hitchcock and and he was one of the first, if if I'm not mistaken, um, first filmmakers that like you know I'm gonna go see a Hitchcock movie, you know, mm -hmm, uh, you know, mm -hmm. as as we might now today go, I'm gonna go see a Tarantino film, which brings me to Tarantino, mm -hmm. who arguably is one of the more interesting branded directors um, mm -hmm. to come out of the '90s. He was the uh, the first mm -hmm. rock and roll. They call him like the rock and roll director because he was the hip and cool because before then directors were not hip and cool it wasn't hip and cool to be a director um mm -hmm. other than people in the industry but after tarantino came out with reservoir and pulp fiction um he branded himself very shrewdly about as this kind mm -hmm. of this this um 
this character almost uh, that he plays in his in his world. What do you what do you think of that? What do you think about the branding of Tarantino? But in general, like you know, Chris Nolan has a brand. Fincher has a brand. Now every every of these big directors uh, have their own brands. If you say a Chris Nolan film, you get it. If you say a Fincher mm-hmm. film, you get it. Um, mm-hmm. How imp- what, what's your feeling on that? Well, I think the difference between Tarantino uh, and the other two amazing directors you mentioned is the fact that he was a lifestyle brand. In other words, mm. if you made a movie, so many people in the early 90s when I was starting Rain Dance wanted to make a movie to be like Tarantino, mm-hmm. to be the cool dude with all the girls. Not that Tarantino's known for that. <laughs> um, but it, it, it just became, I think he was a lifestyle people. I mean, not many people would like to brand themselves personally, like say Chris Nolan, who's got a wife and four, or is it now five kids? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know David Fincher. I guess the other director, possibly with the lifestyle brand image, might have been someone like John John Walters. Yeah, uh, perhaps to a um, niche to a niche audience. But yes, to a niche audience. So Tarantino sort of made the role of film director glamorous, I suppose, mm-hmm. um, and brilliantly done, and um, and stumbled very rarely. Yeah, he only on on the movie standpoint, he only stumbled to his own. He admitted himself was the death proof that um, that uh, mm. that film he did with Robert Rodriguez in that Grindhouse mm. film. But other than that, he doesn't stumble very often. You're right. Mm. Uh, it's he's mm. in, he's a very interesting character study as far as branding is concerned. And and I know mm. you know he he was such a rock star that he literally does Japanese you know soft drink commercials and stuff like that. Because over yeah, in Japan, yeah. he's he's literally can't walk the street. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 interesting because you were there at the beginning of that. You were there during the heyday of the independent film movement, which arguably started in '89, as we know it today, with um, Steven Soderbergh with Sex, Lies, and Videotape mm-hmm. when Sundance finally mm-hmm. came on the scene. Then every mm-hmm. year, it seemed like there was just this new. It was Tarantino, Rodriguez, Kevin Smith, mm-hmm. Richard Linkletter. Uh, mm. You know all this kind of stuff. You were there at at that mm. time. How was it from your point of view at Raindance when you when you were because you were in the in the in the thick of it? Well, a bunch of us were trying to make movies for no money because we're all broke back then. Mm-hmm. Um, Edgar Wright's first film, which I have out a bit on, yep. on, called A Fistful of Fingers, which no one's ever seen, or right. very few people have seen. Um, and of course, Nolan was doing The Following, mm-hmm. and no one, no one, no one got what we were doing. And many other films that were made for next to no money, mm-hmm. the following, and it was the one that got out, of course, remade 18 months later as Memento. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're all trying to, it was a friendly com- camaraderie. We were all sharing, but each of us trying to secretly outdo the other. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was fun. It was, it, was a, it was a great spirit. And I liken it possibly to make what I envision the music scene to have been let's say in the 60s 70s with the beatles and the stones and all those people sure um we all kind of hated each other but we all kind of loved each other and we all shared completely shared with each other any tip or trick and of course the other big change back in that time um when you get up to about 95 was the advent of, of video videotape yeah. and people starting to make movies on without a, without the expensive film uh, in 1994, we showed a wonderful film by an American, a New York filmmaker by the name of Sarah Jacobson called Virgin, uh, Mary's Not a Virgin Anymore. And because no one had ever screened any video in a cinema that I was aware of, we had to get someone's home video projector and v- VCR in the day and ha- hardwired into this one of the seats and <laughs> projected on the screen. It was a <laughs> Total fiasco, really. Sure. But we pulled it off. And of course, in 1995, you had Dogma 95, all the Danes making movies. Sure. Uh, really, you know, uh, unusual. That, that was, by the way, Dogma 95 was a simple marketing exercise to get people to watch their films. And it worked. <laughs> it, sure, it sure did. <laughs> um, and, and then in 96, Oh, Panavision gave me a gold 35 millimeter kit, and I found some bunch of recans. Mm-hmm. And we had six different directors shooting a short each day. On the seventh day, all went through the lab quickly, edited together, and that was our closing night film that year. 
one of the directors was a guy called Nicholas Winding Refner. Yes. Who films have done very, very well since then. Drive, of course. Uh, yeah. And we, we were just, we, we didn't, none of us had gone to film school. We were all, a few of us had gone to film school. We are all just trying to look at the, 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 the techniques and how can we do it differently and by doing it differently, could we do it better? Um, anyway, I, I don't want to sound too pompous here, but mm -hmm. remember, I knew nothing then. None of us knew anything or much. Chris Nolan didn't spend a minute in film school. It was all, you know, just like when you're learning to drive a car, you learn by driving. You don't mm -hmm. learn by sitting in a lecture hall. And Chris Nolan and Edgar Wright and everyone else were just found a camera, put some film stock in it, and exposed it to actors mm -hmm. and made every mistake under the book. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. I saw yeah I saw Nolan's first uh, one of his first short films, uh, mm -hmm. Doodle Doodlebug, yeah, and, yeah. and you watch it and you go wow I mean you can start seeing, it's always fascinating like watch Scorsese's first you know shorts and stuff like that and you can start seeing their their style, but mm. it's so crude, uh, mm. in the way they're just doing like the, the the visual effects and that was so crude but mm. that he was able to do something of that level at that time mm. with that technology mm. was pretty amazing. Mm. Yeah, and he was pushing the envelope. Everyone was pushing the envelope. And, um, yeah, I mean, but, you know, we've got a similar situation in the last, um, where are we, December 2017. Two years ago and one month ago, 25 months ago, Alex, there was something equally dramatic. And that was when the New York Times, um, on a Tuesday, launched their VR app, NYT VR. Mm -hmm. And that, that Saturday, if you lived on the East Coast and bought a New York Times, you got the free Google Cardboard that you fold up and put your phone in and watch that stuff. Mm -hmm. And even though VR has been around with us for 40, 50 years, kept alive, ironically, by Disney, NASA, and the American military, mm -hmm. um, suddenly <laughs> VR jumped from geekdom into the mainstream and virtual reality now with Oculus and Facebook and mm -hmm. uh, Samsung and everything. And the energy being uh, that I meet amongst VR creators here at the festival in London, which we've had VR talk for four or five years now, mm -hmm. um, and we've had the VR arcade for a couple of years, sort of the first in Europe, where you walk into a big room and, and try 20, 30 different experiences. That's awesome. Or, or rides. <laughs> as a, in, in Japan, you don't see an experience. You, you go for a ride. Right. On whatever type of film it is, and 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 again the sharing and caring and the sharing of techniques and the excitement when your competitor, your rival, does something new and you go, oh my god, and they tell you how they did it, and then you're off to trying to outdo them in a very friendly, competitive uh, atmosphere. It reminds me of what it was like in the early nineties when I might add, Alex, mm -hmm. Princess Diana was still alive. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, it's it yeah, it's go it goes back a bit. Mm. Uh, now in your opinion, um how can filmmakers today make film make filmmaking into a viable business where they're not just making one movie and 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 hoping and praying that it's going actually going to do something. How can what is a business model to be like a, a, a not a, a rich filmmaker but like a sustainable filmmaker in your opinion? Yeah, well that is the real trick. First of all, I think we have to realize that the traditional feature film, hour and a half, two hours long, distribution, cinema, whatever, that, that's pretty much broken. Mm -hmm. So one has to think of yourself as a multi-format visual content creator, doing shorts, documentaries, music videos, uh, and, and everyone will fall into a niche. Mm -hmm. um, but if you limit yourself to making, making a two-hour two feature film, uh, I think the days sadly, of the new Sex, Lies, and Videotape, Steven Soderbergh, I think those days are over. Mm -hmm. I mean, I shouldn't say that because every once in a while someone gets damn lucky and, and hits a, a, a home run and, and makes it. But see, the cinema, the, 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 cinema, the, the cinemas, the, the theatrical owners, they're, they're in great peril because they're afraid people aren't going to want to go to the movie theater when it's so easy to see a film on Netflix. Sure. Net Netflix and Amazon are spending all kinds of money in movies, but only those with stars. So how do you, I mean, that's the business model. Can you get a, a well-known actor to be in your low-budget movie, 
can you give them a, a piece of the back end so mm-hmm. that could work? Or can you get known as someone who can take really good video? Ah, if you're really broke and need a, a grand, can you do your mate's wedding or high school graduation, whatever? Yeah, that's kind of boring. Or can you come up with a series of short, punchy mini docs and sell them to one of the broadcasters or do your own web series on, on YouTube or Vimeo mm-hmm. to make money on the ads? Can you get known as someone, this is where your branding comes in, what kind of filmmaker are you? Mm-hmm. We have, on our MA program, we have a woman comes from a very strict Asian family. She's 27 and single, lives with her mom and dad and brother and sister above a chip shop in East London. Mm-hmm. And she joined the program last year to write and direct a horror feature. Mm-hmm. But a few months into the program, um, her parents started hassling her because she was single and in their culture and religion sure. beyond marrying age. Mm-hmm. And she came into my office a while ago in tears uh, because mom and dad had said that she's got to meet this guy Friday night. And she knows this guy from the religious services on the weekend. Just can't stand him, but it's got to keep mom and dad happy. Mm-hmm. So what she decided to do was to change her MA thesis from writing and directing a horror film into writing and directing a web series called The One and for the next few weeks, she would go out with a camera crew to each of the Friday night dates. <laughs> That's genius. And she's now, she's now doing, she's got a few episodes. She's now taking some time off to expand her social media. But it's the kind of program that you might watch, be it Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist. You might just want to watch that because that's an iconic moment. When do you meet the first person? Mom and dad are always hassling you to find someone right, mm-hmm. right? And, and she's, she could parlay that into very interesting personal branding experience of someone dealing with uh, women's issues living within this certain cultural stereotype. So, so in your opinion, then, it's, it's not about, and I've said this too as well, but it's not about just doing the 90-minute the, the feature film or the two-hour feature no. film. And, no. and just being that filmmaker, just being a feature film director, you've got to be able to venture out as a content creator in multiple revenue streams, if you will, whether that be the wedding, whether that be the shooting this or shooting that or creating branded content or shooting stock yeah. footage and and getting yeah. those re- – just multiple yeah. things using the skill set of a filmmaker. Yeah, I, th- I think so. And then, of course, if I was starting out – I wanted to make good money as a visual content creator, I would ditch the so-called flatty and focus on virtual reality because there's not enough technicians to, to handle the work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in 360 video and in the VR world, uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of potential in that environment without question. And there's le- less competition for sure. Yeah, and gaming and augmented reality and VR and MR and XR and all the different forms of that. I mean, it's, it's, it's the, that, that whole, people say 3D and VR kind of fad. That's not true. VR is not a fad. It's the biggest thing that's happened to visual images since the marriage, I think, of sound to picture. Mm-hmm. It, it is, it's going to, I'm very curious to see where VR goes. I'm curious to see what, how it's going to impact our day-to-day life as, as the moving image and sound did, uh, you know, well, to the exactly. certain, it's, it, and, it, and, the, and no one's figured it out. And it could be that someone listening to this show will start focusing on that, figuring out how to use uh, VR and do to their career what, I don't know, Lucas or Hitchcock did to their career. Because it, it's a brand new thing and no one really knows what the hell's going on. And the difference between movie and cinema and VR is when we had cinema, we were looking at a flat screen, a bit like the cross arch of a theater, and we had stories from theater that would work on cinema. But in VR, you see, we have the technology first, but we don't have, there's nothing to base it on, unless possibly you, you look at theater in the round. Mm-hmm. But I am digressing terribly from the original topic of this conversation. <laughs> Which is how to make money as a viable, how to make filmmaking a viable business. No, but it, 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 everything you've said, it, it definitely helps in answering that question without, without, mm-hmm. without question. Um, mm-hmm. Now, you've met, I'm sure, a handful of filmmakers in your lifetime. Um, mm. And you've seen a handful of first-time films. What mm. is the biggest mistake you see filmmakers make with their first movie, or and made this, made this two-part question with their first film or project, 
and with their career as a general statement? Uh, from the film point of view, no story, no story, no story, no story. Got it. And if you look at the first films that have succeeded, like Chris Nolan's or Tarantino's, they did tell a story, mm -hmm. a very compelling story. And the second thing that most filmmakers forget is that making a film is only 10% of the, of the process, 90% is selling it. So either, as Chris Nolan did, as Edgar Wright did, hook up with a producer who knows that side of it, so you can then go back and focus on the creative side, or you damn well learn how to do it yourself. And most film directors I've met, new film directors, have not a clue about the business side, make or have ideas to make films that are so unrealistic in the marketing aspect mm -hmm. that even if they did coerce their relatives to mortgage their houses and give them this huge sum of money, they would have absolutely no chance of, of recouping. Right. So, so it's an interesting thing. Filmmakers need to be part mathematician, part scientist, part artist, but above all, entrepreneurial. Mm-hmm. Yes, I, I, I preach that on a constant, a constant basis. Good. I know you do. Uh, now, what are some tips that you have for no-budget filmmakers? Uh, well, first of all, you need to do something that is in one or two locations. Most of the budgets that I work on go up every time you have to move the camera and crew from one part of the city to another. So if you can think of uh, something that's contained um, – as buried was the American, as Reservoir Dogs was. When mm -hmm. Michael Madsen was at London, he said they parked the, the equipment van in the warehouse. You could walk to the restaurant and walk to what was Tim Roth's apartment, all mm -hmm. within a 10, 15 minute walk. Mm -hmm. So that's one, one thing. The other tip is uh, don't, I mean, make the movie with what you've got, not with what you want to have. Mm -hmm. And whatever the amount of money you have, no matter how modest the amount of money is, um, there's always a way to do it uh, with what you've got. I've worked as my life on the scenic artist. I worked on Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I worked on huge budget films. And I also worked on very micro budget films. And on every single film I've worked on, and I've worked as a scenic artist, Alex, and over 68, I think it's 68 feature films, mm -hmm. not, not once did we have enough money. So no matter how many tens of millions, <laughs> never had enough money. Isn't that the case always? <laughs> and and the difference is with micro budget or no budget is you really need to spend an awful lot of time pre-planning. Because unlike a big budget film, if you screw up, you cannot throw money at it. Right. No money well, hose. Yeah. On these big money films that they have to reshoot that cost them five million, they just go and do it. You, we We can't do that in the low budget realm. And I guess my final bit of advice would be get several strangers to read your script. Mm -hmm. Like it a whole lot. And if anyone ever tells you as a writer that your script is good, it probably means it's shitty. Right. <laughs> That's a great piece of advice, honestly. Now, um, I have a few questions left that I ask all my, uh, all my guests. Um, yes. What advice would you give a filmmaker just trying to break into the business today? There's a, a two-letter word in the English language that you have to delete from your vocabulary, and it starts with the letter N. Mm -hmm. O. Mm -hmm. Just get rid of that. You're going to hear that so many times. You just have to completely um, ignore that word. Okay. Can you tell me the book that had the biggest impact on your life or career? I, God, I've read so many. If I had to pick one... It would be, oh, I even forget the author's name. It was called Reading for a Living. It was written in 1974, and it was advice on how to analyze uh, scripts and, and manuscripts. And it gave you this grid that you filled in, plot, structure, and so on. Um, God, I can't even remember the guy's name. American, I might add. What was the name of the book uh, again? Reading for a Living. It cost okay. like $8 on Amazon. Okay. Um, but I remember looking at that and suddenly realizing how important it was to look at a script and how to look at a script. So I think I learned more from that than just about anything. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Patience. Yeah, same. That's my. That's mine too. <laughs> Patience. Um, and what are three of your favorite films of all time? Well, I only have one really. Um, 
I grew up, this Amish guy, I told never to go to the movie theater. And one hot August harvest day, I had to, I was sent to the local village outside Toronto to deliver a part to the blacksmith. Mm-hmm. My dad couldn't fix it, and they really needed it. When I found out the blacksmith was going to take three hours to repair this, it wasn't worth me going all the way back home. Sure. And coming back, hot summer's day, I was 16. I had a few coins in my pocket, Alex, and I was wondering what the devil looked like. And lo and behold, three doors down from the house of the Lord was the house of the devil, the movie theater. And I walked up, trembling, and I found out <laughs> back then they only they only charged 99 cents to see what the devil looked like. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I paid my money. I walked in. Now remember, Alex, I had no idea what happened in a movie theater. Right, I was only told, never, ever go in. Wow, you were pretty brave. So there I am, 16, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, hot summer's day, walked in. You know, it's a bit like church. They sure. got chairs lined up facing the front. But I noticed the color of the fabric on the chairs was red. Yes. The color <laughs> of the devil. I sit down, a couple other people that hot summer's day, they turned the flipping lights off. Uh. And the first face of the devil I saw at the tender age of 16 was Lassie comes home. And I cried like a baby. And at the end, I rushed up to see if I could feel the texture on the screen. It was all gone in the twinkling of eye. Uh-huh. And that movie changed that moment, changed my life. Ever after, I was in love with movies. Wow. And I'm assuming you didn't tell your parents when you got home. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> <laughs> that's an amazing story actually that's a really great great story um, now where can people find you and in, in the work you do with Raindance well raindance.org is our website and mm-hmm. I'm pretty easy to find there's signposts all through the website and if any of your listeners have an article they'd like to write about anything about their experience or something they've learned uh, please send it in and and we'll we'll publish it and lots of people will look at it we're getting eight, 9,000 people a day looking at our website and it's not by any means, the biggest, but it's bigger than most in Europe. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely, it is. It is, a, and it's a great, uh, a great resource, a great um, hub of resources for filmmakers as well. So, uh, definitely check it out. And and again, Elliot, thank you so much for being on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure finally getting to uh, to chat with you and talk shop. Well, thank you very much, and and congratulations on all the great work you've done as well. And by the way, Alex. Mm-hmm. Um, we were talking before we recorded this, but please let's let's work together. This is the spirit of filmmaking, true filmmaking. It's mm-hmm. not enemies. No. We're not rivals. No. We are working together. So let's see how much we can share with each other and with your listeners and with all the viewers from Rain Dance. Absolutely. Thanks again, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Elliot, so much for coming on the show and dropping some major knowledge bombs for the Indie Film Hustle tribe. I hope you guys really enjoyed that episode. Elliot is a rock star in the indie film world. So again, thank you, Elliot, for sharing some knowledge with the tribe. If you want links to anything we discussed in this episode, just head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 223 for the show notes. And I do have an announcement. Monday is the day that I will finally be releasing the information about my top secret project. I cannot wait to show you guys. I've just been in the lab working hard, hard, hard on this top secret project, and I cannot wait to share it with you guys. So get ready for Monday to hopefully have your minds blown. (laughs) Until then, keep that hustle going, keep that dream alive, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 